So welcome everyone. Thank you so much to first Kristen. She's um, for helping to arrange uh, and plan this event to Ramon and to um, Sophia for um, their interest and enthusiasm for bringing Seth uh, and to the NYU College of Global Public Health. Um, my name is Terry Yuan and I wear many hats. I'm a social entrepreneur. I'm um, a feminist, intersectional feminist, and I'm an activist, uh, an advocate to end uh, interpersonal violence and gender-based violence. And I'm also a podcast host of my podcast called Engendered. Um, so I've invited Seth to join us today, and I want to give you some background um, uh, on Seth before we get started. Seth Sheldon is an attorney, a scholar, a law professor, an activist, um, a performer. He, he is also currently the United Nations liaison for the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN. And you may have heard about, of ICANN's work um, in the past several years. ICANN won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. And Seth was in Oslo to be part of uh, that momentous honor. ICANN won the Nobel Prize for its work in drawing attention to the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons and for advancing a new treaty prohibiting such weapons. And Seth is here with us today to speak about his journey as a scholar and an activist, his work as ICANN's United Nations liaison, and what we can do to help build awareness about these issues and join the movement to promote nuclear disarmament in the United States. We will also be talking about his observations on gender justice in the humanitarian sector. So thank you, Seth, for being a part of today. I um, really appreciate you sharing your story and experience with me and the NYU community. And I understand that you've not gotten a lot of sleep the past few days, so even more so. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, we weren't sure if you were going to be available today because of the, the other um, um, momentous uh, part of today, but thank you. No, I'm really uh, excited to be here. I hope I, <laughs> I hope I can do a good job for you, but thank you for having me. Um, and I don't think I've ever had a chance to congratulate in, you in person for being part of the ICANN team to, to win the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017, 2017 so congratulations. Thank you. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been bananas. <laughs> so, um, Seth and I know each other from, um, is it okay for me to share? <laughs> I don't know what you're going to say, but so, I'll just say yes. So, we, so um, Seth's mom is um, my favorite and most important teacher um, in my life. And so I, I met Seth through his mom who taught um, Gothic English to me for a full year in high school. Um, and so we were part of that community. We went to Stuyvesant High School. Um, and um, his mom is also a great activist. And so I've followed Seth's you know, work and his career and his journey. And one of the things that I read, um, which I was surprised about, is that you in high school spoke in an interview about reading the John Hershey book, Hiroshima and that having a profound impact on you, which I haven't heard anybody having said that about any high school experience, so mm -hmm. I really want you to start off with that. Okay, well, I didn't speak in an interview. You mean that I, I in another interview, I referenced right. that I read right. that book in high school, which I did, yeah. yeah. And, and it's, it's um, that's true. That is, I think that uh, I, I identified that as a turning point in my personal journey with nuclear weapons uh, and you know, I, I growing up uh, as a boy in the Cold War era, I dutifully followed my <laughs> gendered construction and my American identity, and understood that um, I was really interested in World War II. I was really, in, um, as an American, I was really interested in World War II as a Jewish uh, person, and uh, I was taught and believed that atomic weapons were the reason that the U.S. won the war in the Pacific. That we saved lives by using them, um, and uh, and that the survival of everyone then, even until that day, was maintained by this delicate ba balance of power between uh, superpowers that could threaten each other with nuclear annihilation. So, I read Hiroshima when I was like, yeah, like 13 or something years old, and 
the stories that he related so vividly demonstrated the disproportionate, indiscriminate, and inhumane impact of, of these weapons on civilian lives. And it was the first time that I was faced with truly thinking through the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a momentous experience. I mean, I've come to believe since that, and because I, and I can trace it to that book, you know, this, this belief I have now that, that no country um, should have these weapons um, or be able to uh, threaten to use them with, without, um, and that it, that it wouldn't be possible for anyone to have these arsenals without eventually, by, whether by purpose or on accident, ending civilization. <laughs> Um, and so, um, yeah, the, and that book, I think, led me there. I suppose this is a good time to, for me to, to plug that in 2015, uh, the, uh, to commemorate the 70th anniversary of, of, uh, of the atomic bombings in Hiroshima, uh, the New Yorker put Hiroshima online for free. So anyone can go read it if uh, you want to. Uh, and it's still, it's still online for free? Yeah, yeah, it's still oh. there. I, I checked that link. Um, the last time I said this. Great, thank <laughs> um, you. <laughs> and and you know it's it, for those who don't know what it is because I guess I could have started with that. It's 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 uh, he, um, John Hersey was was in Hiroshima in the in the days following the uh, the use of the weapons in in Hiroshima and um, the first atomic bomb that was dropped in warfare and documented. Uh, the the horrific experiences on specific individuals uh, and told told a story about it. Um, I, I guess every individual needs to decide for themselves if twelve or thirteen is too young to uh, to read a book like that. But for me, it was uh, in, whatever else it was. It was hugely impactful. Would you say that your experience was unique as a thirteen, fourteen year old reading that book and your the impact that it had on you? And I'm, and I'm asking because um, today happens to also mark the anniversary for the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas um, shooting. And we've seen how these young people over the past year have you know, really become national leaders or maybe even international leaders um, and engaged in civic, been models for civic action uh, in ways that we haven't seen before. And so I'm wondering, I mean, that was a very exceptional experience. What were some of the experiences of your peers when you read that book? Did you have anybody to share it with and what was their response? I don't know, of course, to a person, how people reacted to that book and I don't have the memory of what other people said. Um, I, I assume that people were similarly uh, impacted the way I was, but I'm also sure that some people had had another reaction, and um, and I guess uh, it, it's uh, when when people when people have trauma of any kind, I, I suppose they react in different ways, and um, and you know I, I, I'm I'm incredibly inspired by the March for Our Lives movement and those young people, uh, and incredibly disheartened that it takes. Uh, first-hand experience with tragedy sometimes to motivate people to 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 act but um, you know I was very privileged that this you know third-hand experience of reading this book is what did it for me and that I didn't have to have something like that so after college you went to University of North, Ca North Carolina Chapel Hill for college yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry for college yeah. and um, was there anything there that stood out for you and shaped, continued to shape this um, um, this consciousness that you developed and started in high school, courses that you took or experiences you've had. Yeah, I'm sure. I haven't thought so much about this. Um, I don't think, but first of all, college was a wonderful experience for me, and uh, and then and I had uh, a number of experiences and classes that I I bet have shaped the way I think about a lot of things, including, of course, the political science classes. Um, but um, I would say that a lot of my favorite classes were, you know, art classes, theater, sculpture, that, um, and it's, I couldn't possibly figure out, traced together how everything added up to uh, the opinions that I have. Um, I was not, and still am not, do not consider myself a natural uh, activist. I 
I don't like public speaking. I don't like, um, you know, I, I, uh, I, I do, I've been doing the things I've been doing of late, despite the fact that I don't feel that it's a natural fit for me to, um, to, to, to think like an activist, to uh, try to uh, frame issues in, 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 with, you know, in very um, absolutist kind of sh short phrases, you know, it's, it's hard for me to, to, to think like that, um, but I consider it vastly important for people to do it, and so I'm trying to do it more, and I certainly support other people who do do it. But college, you know, to your question, it's just, uh, it's hard to say. Um, um, yeah, I, I, did, I, did, I did graduate with a degree in international studies, and I, and I focused on um, uh, economics and uh, international, um, I wrote a thesis about the Israeli nuclear uh, program that, of course, was relevant to what I'm doing now, but uh, otherwise, uh, uh, not much was. I wish I had taken more math classes. I wish I had taken more science classes. To be honest, I think that would uh, have helped me in certain ways. But, uh, but I loved I loved going to college. And what made you decide to go to law school? Yeah, I mean that was um, not a natural. I didn't think that I was going to law school before uh, long before I went. I didn't know what I was heading to do. I certainly didn't see how it was going to lead me to working in uh, nuclear weapons policy. Uh, for me, um, and in fact, that, that's compounded by the fact that in American law schools, we don't, in the core curriculum, uh, emphasize um, uh, international law, or at least the, the main curricula tends to emphasize private and national law over public and international law. Uh, however, it, it did seem to me that um, in graduating for college and not exactly being sure where I was going, that people who, who you know, I should also say that I, I came from uh, a background of artists, writers, musicians, teachers uh, in my family. So I didn't really have, I didn't know in my family who to follow or whose path that I should follow when I wanted to do something a little different as well. And it just seemed to me that the people who were trusted with meaningful roles in, in policy and society seemed to have backgrounds in law. So I thought, oh, okay, if I want to do something, perhaps that's something I should do. I don't recommend that as being a, a motivation necessarily for everyone, but um, to each their own, I suppose. And, and, um, but in law school, I, I pursued intellectual property law, and that's still my field, my main field now. Um, and I think it's because... Um, I did have a basis for, if not for understanding law, I did have a basis for understanding creativity and innovation based on my artistic background, and that's the core of IP subject matter. So um, that's how I ended up mm -hmm. doing that. But um, S since you mentioned um, law as, as having practical uses, I, it made me think about David Coleman, the uh, president of the College Board, who recently came out. Um, saying that there are two languages or two codes, I guess two languages that he thinks every student should um, know f for the future. And one of them is um, coding, of course, and the other one is the Constitution. And mm. so very closely, like just being able to understand sort of the, um, the tools that make up our society, our policies and practices, and, and being able to have a language for um, being critical of it and, and um, potentially making changes to it. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you are, you've been not once, but a two-time recipient of the Fulbright Scholarship, first in Latvia and then in Japan as a Fulbright Specialist Program Fellow. Um, in 2012-2013, you were awarded a Fulbright to study in Latvia. We'll start there. Okay. Your project was titled Introduction to the United States Intellectual Property Law in the Global Age, the Intangible Building Blocks of Modern Commerce. How did that experience build upon your knowledge base on international relations, economics, and contribute to your scholarship in geopolitics? Well, uh, I didn't even remember the title, so you just said <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, 
it was my first time living abroad for for an extended period of time. I first, traveled first a lot. Of all, I think yeah. we should say, where is Latvia? Because oh, lot, you, yeah. I don't know if everybody Look, there, knows, because I certainly <laughs> have a hard like, time finding it on the map. Europeans who, I, I promise you, have no idea where it is, and people who confuse Balkans and Baltics all the time. And uh, I'm, not making, President I'm not making fun of any of them, yeah. because I, 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 I think <laughs> right? I have a lot of trouble with, with semantics and language a lot of the time. And um, But yes, I, I can at least... I can at least correct it, it, it and uh, yeah, Latvia is, a, a, well, there's some debate as to whether we would call the region Eastern Europe or Northern Europe in the region, but um, it's one of the three Baltic states, uh, former Soviet republics, uh, formerly of the USSR, uh, and, uh, and the, it's from, from west to east, it's Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, uh, and, um, and with Latvia sandwiched in the middle. And it's a, it's a it's a hidden gem, so I guess I shouldn't say it that much in public. That is a hidden gem to to ruin that. But it's a, it was one of my favorite places I've ever lived, and it was um, a really to your first question. I mean, it it was a very educational experience for me to live at perhaps you could say crossroads of east and west, um, and to interact in that society for a while. Uh, I, again, it's one of these things. I don't have a tidy answer for how it adds up to where I am right now. But it, it was uh, I got to work a lot with the U.S. Embassy there and with the U.S. Ambassador there. We did some presentations together. And again, it was mostly my focus was on private law. Uh, I wasn't thinking as much about public law uh, at that time. And um, yeah, yeah, but it, it was. It still just has been part of this long and hopefully very continuing road of, of educating and learning about, of educating myself and other people's people as well about um, uh, a whole bunch of things. And I've, I've just learned a, a lot from the experience. Was uh, there anything in particular about that country that um, attracted you to studying there and, and the alignment with the, the topic? Uh, well, uh, First, that it was a, a, a young state politically, and at least the recent incarnation of, of Latvia and the Baltic states, uh, that was uh, still thinking through and continues to still think through some of the earlier stages of of its of its laws. So, you know, I had an opportunity to uh, to work with policymakers, uh, like for instance, once I worked with a, a working group that was modifying the Estonian copyright law and um, got to sit in a room with uh, a German copyright professor and uh, I, I guess it was a German, a Russian, and I think a Latvian. I may have that wrong, I'm not totally remembering, but for you know some some days and 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 myself and 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 everyone would say, well, you know in Germany, we do this rule this way, and you should do it that way. And you know, I would say in America, this is how we do it. You know how we address that issue or that rule, and um, that was fascinating. You know? And then they would sit there and think through, well, how should we do it? It's very Estonia to take that example. It's, it's an incredibly uh, small country <coughs> compared to if I, I don't know where everyone is from here, but of course, uh, if you're American, it's it's a little, it's it's quite amazing to think through uh, a country that is. I think 1.2 million people. That's half the size of Brooklyn, basically. Mm. Um, and uh, and 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 how th how how differently it works to to to, uh, to write policy with with less bureaucracy than you have in bigger countries. Um, and that that is okay. Now I found a nexus to I think the 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 I can work because that has been part of that experience has been uh, I've been working with a lot of smaller states and. Uh, and completely amazed by how th how fast things can move in, in states without you know 12 levels of bureaucracy to 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 work through any policy um, it, it's there's there's positive things to say about that and there's negative things to say about that but one thing i can certainly say is it's amazing it's 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 really remarkable uh, how different that is and uh, growing up as an american it's it's very eye-opening to see that that's that exists anywhere. Mm. 
So in 2016, 2017, you were selected to be a Fulbright Specialist Program Fellow um, in a shorter program, this time to study in Japan. Yeah. And it was in Japan that you first learned about the long-lasting effects of nuclear weapons in, on society there. Can you talk about that experience? Yeah, I mean, again, as I would say, it wasn't the first time I had uh, thought about that or, or, or learned about it, but it was my first time in Japan, so it was the first time I could visit the museums in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and see uh, those presentations of the impact of the nu nuclear of nuclear weapons there, and and think through the very complicated relationship Japan has with nuclear weapons uh, firsthand. That was an invaluable experience for me. I was also there during the 2016 election, so uh, I was having that emotional and intellectual reaction to. Uh, to to processing as best as I could some of what happened in uh, 1942, 1945 rather, um, and um, at the same time as I was processing what was happening uh, here in 2016, and uh, you know, I, but as far as what I learned, or what I, what I learned as far as the. Uh, the factual matter, it, it was uh, nothing I, a lot of what, a lot of things I couldn't, that I was able to read in books or even had read in books before, uh, but uh, I think it was more the emotional impact of seeing it presented by uh, Japanese citizens uh, that, that really affected me. But, but not only what, that, that wasn't the only thing that affected me. For example, I remember being in Hiroshima, they have a hallway at the end of the museum, because you're directed through it in a you know in, in a path, and at the end you end up in this hallway where it's um, there are all these contributions from world leaders who have come to visit Hiroshima um, and left generally signed something or left a picture or something like this. Uh, of course, uh, one of the most important ones that they were highlighting at that time was President Obama's visit, being the first American president to go to Hiroshima. And uh, there, there was, uh, it was the first time that I cried in that whole museum, I realized, because a lot of it was difficult to process, uh, but it was, uh, it, it, again, stuff that I, I kind of understood factually, and oh, who knows why this happened, but I think it was, Seeing the, his that they've had this in this display case, these two perfectly folded paper cranes. Now, for those who don't know, of course, the paper cranes are uh, an important uh, uh, symbol used uh, throughout Japan uh, among Japanese people uh, as a symbol of hope, but in particular to commemorate the uh, effects of the atomic bombings. Uh, there was a a, um, a very famous story about a girl who was suffering from radiation uh, radiation poisoning and a resulting cancer and who uh, basically said she wanted to make a thousand cranes before she died and it inspired a lot of people around the world to then make cranes and send them in. So there's cranes everywhere and paper cranes are a symbol uh, for many people about nu uh, relating to nuclear weapons. And, and so I visited this, I saw this, this case with his two, two perfectly folded paper cranes and thought, gosh, you know, this guy is, was good at so many things. And then I, because it's not easy to do, I've done it myself and I thought like, how did they, did they just teach him backstage right there? How did, how did this even happen? You know, and, and then I reflected right in that moment, I recall, on, on the, the notion of our, our next president, who, our president-elect, <laughs> being asked to do something like that. And, um, yeah, it really it hit me in a huge way at that moment to think, to think of how how he would react to to such a request and and how um, how much it matters to uh, to and and I'm not celebrating by the way, especially as an ICANN representative, I'm not celebrating uh, Obama's work in uh, it, with respect to nuclear weapons uh, and and our pursuit of, of eliminating nuclear weapons at all because we we. We do not believe that he was a, a great partner in the end on this issue, but uh, I, rhetoric does matter, we know, and and I believe anyway, and um, and it, it it is important that 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 I think our leadership now reflects a completely different ethic on 
<clears throat> on 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 this issue and 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 would have reacted so so terribly different there. So from there you found your way to ICANN. Um, right. Tell tell us. Right. It, it was. How did you get in, I'm that just that kind experience? Of that no. This, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I mean that definitely links because it was being there that made me think. Okay. I I know that I need to. I, I, I do believe my instinct from what I've read and being uh, interested in this issue for so long is that this is going nuclear weapons are going to matter in, a, in an enormous way again um, and um, and that proved to be quickly true I mean nobody was talking about nobody in the US was really talking about nuclear weapons in, before 2017 right um, and then all of a sudden, and almost immediately, it was back on the table in this uh, in this major way in terms of world policy. And so, I, uh, having seen that coming, knew that I wanted to participate. I knew that it, the UN was uh, about to start negotiating uh, for some kind of a nuclear weapons ban, and that was a, uh, a hugely historic uh, uh, move in in shift in. Uh, in the way that the nations of the world were thinking about uh, how to deal with nuclear abolition, and I wanted to be a part of it. And I think it's uh, like so many things, uh, some combination of uh, of determination, luck, and privilege that led me to get into those negotiations and participate. And um, I joined initially w up with. Um, the uh, Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy, which I'm uh, now one of uh, the board members of, and um, and and once I was there, I, I quickly started looking to the the campaign for for things to do, and uh, started volunteering and working on everything from helping with research and negotiation to uh, then getting much more involved through campaign leaders such as Daniel Hugsta and Tim Tim Wright. With lobbying states to support the negotiations, participate in negotiations, and then to vote for adoption of the treaty uh, by the end, by the middle of that year in July. Can you break down a little bit? You you talked about luck, determination, and privilege. Like what 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 the actual steps were that you took when you had the once you had the idea that this is something you wanted to pursue. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I I think as soon as the, the I, as soon as I decided that I could do it. Um, uh, the determination part kicked in, and I, I guess, um, spent I think like a week in the library, in a library, not like looking at books, but in my at my computer, uh, researching and trying to figure out everyone who was working on this and who the who the major players were. Um, luck was uh, that I I picked one person to contact. I just chose one, and uh, I couldn't have known then that he would be. Uh, this is Dr. John Burroughs, who's the executive director of the Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy. I couldn't have really known then that he would be so knowledgeable and such a respected resource, and that he would have such a such a role in the negotiations. But he did, and and luck as well that he said, "Yeah, sure, come help me. Um, here's you know, here's a badge," and uh, that was it. That was all that it took. And privilege that I managed to have. Well, both that, that's, I think the privilege was him saying that I could do it because he probably looked at my profile, saw my background and said, sure, this seems like someone who could help me. Uh, but also that I had the opportunity in terms of my time and money to, to volunteer essentially at first. Um, and volunteer full time for so long was, it wasn't not easy for me, but it was more possible than I think for, so many people, obviously, to do that. Mm -hmm. So, when you once you were engaged in working on the campaign, what were some of the uh, challenges that you faced? How did you move past them? Well, I, I think. Well, I already alluded to the fact that I this is not that being an activist is not a natural fit for me. Uh, being, uh, I'm an introvert. I don't like. Talking to in public, and I don't like talking. You're also a performer. Yeah, well, actor. I mean, I, I think <laughs> I, the the great weird dissonance of my life is trying to do things that make me get over the things that I'm not good at. You know, I I I, I was saying I wish I had taken more math and physics in school too, because I'm I'm not good at it. You know, and I I think I think that that's something. Um, I'm always trying to do, but don't always do successfully, of course, but try and break out of that comfort zone. So 
yeah, uh, I think that has has con has been and continues to be a big challenge for me. Is is working through my shyness and learning from these people who I'm sure deal with the same issues, but are so inspiring with the way they 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 are activists, they are diplomats, they are uh, policymakers, and they are strong. Um, I've learned from so many women and men who have uh, have done such an amazing job uh, for their entire lives and themselves stand on the shoulders, of course, of other people who have worked on nuclear abolition for their entire lives, uh, but have in, but are just incredible examples of speaking truth to power and uh, and trying to be inspired by them when I can, despite my misgivings about 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 speaking in, in public uh, or speaking you know or, or taking someone on about their strongly held beliefs. So can you talk about also the treaty itself um, and what you had hoped to accomplish um, and where we are now? Yeah, okay, happily. Um, so the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, I have a copy I could pass around actually because I talk about it uh, or work with it in some way every day. It was adopted at the United Nations uh, General Assembly on uh, July 7th, 2017, by an overwhelming majority of the world. Um, the vote uh, on July 7th, when it was, well, that's a dramatic story right there that I can also tell the day of the adoption was one of the most exciting days of my life. Uh, but the vote was, uh, was 122 states to one, uh, with one abstention. Um, and it is, uh, the treaty is the first comprehensive ban on nuclear weapons. Now that's something that we managed for all other weapons of mass destruction prior to now for chemical weapons and biological weapons, landmines, cluster munitions. But, um, you know, all other weapons of mass destruction except for the most destructive. And so that, uh, that, that, that gap, uh, that, that moral gap, that legal gap, was one that uh, this treaty seeks to rectify. So uh, by, by a comprehensive ban, what I mean is that the treaty prohibits every action along the life cycle of a nuclear weapon, um, developing, testing, producing, manufacturing, transferring, uh, 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 possessing, stationing, stockpiling, using, of course, and threatening to use, importantly, nuclear weapons. It also has uh, what we call positive obligations, basically um, uh, requirements that nations have to provide assistance to the victims of the use and testing of nuclear weapons and to remediate uh, environments that have been harmed by or contaminated by nuclear weapons. Uh, and um, it also has uh, other prohibitions, including uh, prohibitions on uh, assisting, encouraging, or inducing anyone to to do anything that's prohibited, and that's interpreted very importantly to in other treaties anyway. Generally speaking, to prohibit uh, investment in and um, other financial support for producers of nuclear weapons. So that's what it is. In short, uh, it's a little longer than that. Uh, and um, and how what's the status of it? You asked. Uh, so the treaty is not yet in legal force. It will enter into force once 50 nations have, ratifi have ratified it. At the moment, we have 21 ratifications, which is um, at least as fast as similar weapons of mass destruction treaties have gone, uh, including what uh, all states refer to as the cornerstone of nuclear, uh, uh, of the nuclear policy world that we live in today, the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. Um, and we have 70 signatures of the treaty on the treaty, and we have, like I said, 122 states uh, that voted to adopt. Um, and actually, subsequent votes and, and resolutions at the UN have shown that supportive states are closer to 135. So that's what we're drawing from to get our 50. And that is my main job today, really, um, as I speak to you today, because I wear so many hats. But uh, working at the UN today, uh, I'm working with these, these states to encourage them and to work with them on getting to their ratification. Uh, we hope that we will enter into force within about a year or at the end of the year, I, I, I hope, if I can do that work well. So the, none of the nations that actually have nuclear weapons 
uh, voted on the treaty, does that mean that once it's ratified, they're not held to the treaty because they didn't vote on it? Right. Or how does that work, so, work in terms of enforcement? That's, that's right. So the U.S. is not expected to sign or ratify the treaty for some time, sadly. Um, they, they were given, they had an opportunity, of course, to participate in, in the treaty and, uh, and in quite a reversal of the usual, the construct that we're used to, it was the U.S. and their NATO allies that stood outside of the General Assembly on the first day of negotiations and held a protest, uh, which um, struck a lot of people as some, some sort of strange role reversal. But uh, we, um, we certainly did hope that they would participate, but the strategy, ICANN strategy, at the same time contemplated and was prepared for the eventuality that the possessor states, uh, of course, might say that we'd, we'd like not to abolish these weapons that we have. Um, and so this, the strategy is, is, has been clear-eyed and, 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 clear -eyed and, and realistic about uh, uh, the fact that they would not join and, and thought, well, if they do not join, then what impact and how can the rest of the world impact uh, the reality of, of nuclear weapons in the, in the states that actually possess them. And so uh, we have followed the example of other treaties, uh, other weapons of mass destruction treaties that face the similar problem and, uh, and led the way in, in, in what we call the humanitarian shift uh, of, of the disarmament community, uh, which helped change the way uh, we pursued abolition in, in a way that said, what we can do is have the rest of the world uh, stand up as a coalition against these minority, con the minority of, of states that, in the case, case of nuclear weapons, a vast minority of states that, that possess them and pursue them, and change the norm around nuclear weapons by agreeing to, uh, to, to, to themselves uh, to a nuclear-free world. And then what happens? Uh, as we've seen with these other treaties, it actually does impact the possessor states even as much as they protest that it doesn't, even as much as they make the statements that are necessary for them under international law to say, we are hereby clarifying that this does not apply to us, that we won't sign it, that we will never sign it. Actually, on the day that it was adopted, the, new, the US released a statement together with the UK and France that said, that went further than we even expected them to go in terms of we, we were prepared for them to say that we do not support this treaty, we won't sign it. They said we will never sign this treaty, which reflects, I think, to me, how not just hubris, but also this, this fear on their part that they would protest so much to speak for future generations, you know, people who are not yet born yet. We will never, as a state, sign this treaty. What is that? What is that? When do we say that? That's, that's, that sounds... Um, illogical and, 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 and a little insane to me. Um, and, uh, but what we have seen with these other treaties that uh, by changing the norm and by changing the economics around the production uh, and, and possession of, of weapons, that uh, it, has a, it has an impact even on those states that, did not, that do not sign, ratify, or even support a treaty like this. Um, and, uh, you know, there are a lot of examples of that. Um, the, uh, we can speak about how with, uh, with, with, for example, cluster munitions that, um, you know, the, the U.S. did not, they resisted both the landmines treaty and the cluster munitions treaty. Um, but even despite that, uh, the last U.S. manufacturer of cluster munitions just, uh, I think now two years ago, Textron said they would no longer manufacture cluster munitions, and uh, they're in Rhode Island, and, you know, they specifically said that, that there was no longer enough of a market due to the, due to that treaty, and that, um, and they were trying to, that they were trying to recourt investment from people who had pulled out because of that treaty, pulled out of their, um, you know, their financing and their investments. And so, um, you know, I mean, there's, there's many other examples, like I said, we know that the U.S. Law of War Manual, for example, um, says that the U.S. forces shall act consistently with treaties even when the U.S. hasn't signed them if they reflect global public opinion. Um, and we have, conversely, we have seen um, uh, 
memos from manufacturers in the nuclear weapons industry who are celebrating the nuclear posture review, you know, that the Trump's nuclear posture review that 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 said we will now be reinvesting in nuclear weapons mm -hmm. to the tune of 1.2 to 1.7 trillion dollars over the next 30 years. So, um, all this to say that we can see the way these treaties and even our treaty already has impacted um, uh, the way private citizens act and even governments act in states that resist the treaty and we know that it will have an effect on them even if they, until they do join us which of course we hope that they eventually will mm -hmm. and there are other ways too I mean it could provoke you know and nobody here thinks that adopting or even the entering into force of this treaty is 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 the end that you know we we just wipe our hands and say we did it you know that nuclear weapons are now illegal and, and don't exist if they do however uh, we do know that um, it, it is it, it has the potential to provoke uh, to provoke real change in, in very specific ways. So, what's the impact of um, two weeks ago when the U.S. pulled out of the INF, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty from 1987, and then Putin a few days later did the same. I think that, well, there's a lot of potential impacts that are withdrawing and, and at this point just saying we're suspending but likely with the intent to with eventually withdraw from the INF treaty. There's a lot of things that can happen from that, a lot of ripple effects that we, that we see right away. But I think our one immediate takeaway is just another, uh, another uh, sort of example and and more evidence to the notion that the U.S. hopes to restart uh, building nuclear weapons, hopes to to reinitiate re uh, an arms uh, a nuclear arms race, uh, because there were many other options than taking that uh, taking that stance and saying that we're going to withdraw. Um, this for, for this is uh, that choice to to take this option to to, with, to withdraw reflects to me a desire to uh, clear the path for reinvestment in and and uh, rebuilding our our nuclear arsenal. I don't mean rebuilding like it's gone, but but rather building rebuilding up our nuclear arsenal that um, in in a way that we haven't seen for uh, for decades. Yeah. And you started off um, our conversation talking about um, how you, when you were young, you subscribed to, you, you were interested in um, soldiers, et cetera, and that's how you got into uh, in war in general, war tropes. Yeah. And so this, I think, is the perfect example of um, when I saw this news, I posted online, this is just a pissing contest. You know, yeah, a, you're perf right. a perfect example of masculinity. Um, basically a competition between the two forces and the dangers of, of that and, and why we're having this conversation around gender and disarmament. Yeah, and, and we should, mm, I suppose, not be under any illusion that um, we've moved on from in an, a, 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 a huge patriarchal structure that emphasizes these weapons and has emphasized these weapons for you know, since they existed, uh, so that's the real driving problem. I think is that um, it's it's so much work to change the way people think about these weapons to begin with. Uh, it was work for me to change the way I thought about it. So I know what it's like from from one perspective, but that yeah, that speaks to this this fundamental challenge that we have. Um, and speaks to the fact that we're living in this uh, in this enormously uh, structured patriarchy uh, when it comes to uh, weaponry and well, so many things, but in terms of uh, state policy and, uh, and 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 arms. Which brings me to um, the the wider topic of philanthropy and gender. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, several years ago, there was a, a plethora of, it seemed to have come all at, all at once, of 
news uh, around violations uh, in the humanitarian AIDS community um, in terms of sexual misconduct. Um, there were international aid workers who were accused of sexual assault, not just of um, sexual harassment of their employees, their staff, um, and then of course of the people that they were um, supposedly you know, on the ground to serve. And I just want to read something to you about the scandal um, and have you comment on it. Um, so this happened with, you, you're familiar with some, with some yep. of these crises, <clears throat> obviously. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know what you're going to say, but I think I mean, so far <laughs> so I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So, um, so, quote, the, for victims who do manage to speak out, experts say that this culture, quote unquote, of toxic masculinity can make it very difficult for them to be heard. Um, and there was a UN International Development Committee report mm. that cited harassment and assault as being underreported due to the, due to the difficulty of reporting abuse and fear of retaliation in general, which I you know I think is reflected in all of our systems and larger society and work spaces. Um, so I just I'm curious you know, from your experience, is this a topic that is um, present in the conversations you're having? Are people aware of, of and having ma explicit, making explicit connections between gender and gen and sexism and um, the practices and policies that they're actually advancing and then the actual work that they're doing in their relationship that they're developing? Yes, in short. There's a great deal of thinking around uh, this this issue and these related issues in in uh, in the disarmament community, and uh, and I'm not the best person to speak to them. Uh, I should say I'm not an expert when it comes to uh, you know the the gendered impacts and 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 gender issues in uh, this community uh, or with these issues. Um, you know I would I would refer to people from. Uh, thinkers and writers and feminists and activists from like Carol Cohn to Felicity Hill to Ray Atchison um, and the Women's International League of Peace and Freedom which is one of the leading uh, thinkers and active uh, organizations in in this space um, I can speak to some of the things that I've learned from them and perhaps sometimes seen even in my brief time mm -hmm. working with this community but um, but the answer from from me is clearly clearly yes. I mean, both at an interpersonal level and even at a nation state level, uh, in terms of uh, the way uh, policy is 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 created and um, and the way um, people are represented on delegations and the way um, the way we think about arms are all incredibly um, patriarchal and gendered. Um, you know, and 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 to the to the examples you gave, I mean, there there's examples even at the civil society level, and certainly I'm sure at the state level I'm less familiar with, but of of, of horrible specific incidents that people have been dealing with that have reflected uh, the the fact that that feminist voices are way underrepresented in uh, the the arms community. So, you know, I mean, what we're dealing with is a, a long history of gendered constructions that basically say that women shouldn't have a seat at the table and feminist viewpoints shouldn't be reflected when it comes to uh, security and arms policy because women are emotional and weak and, um, and, and also because they are vulnerable and that's the community that we're trying to protect. Um, and, you know, and because we're living in a zero sum Security game where uh, policy um, it should be should basically be reflect the, the that the only issue should be you know who who can win in a zero sum game and that we need to be um, careful about letting uh, issues such as humanitarian consequences uh, be reflected in our policy or even our discussion around that policy. I mean, there's a story um, that I've I know of like third hand through Ray Atchison, but from Carol Cohn. Uh, about a, a, a U.S. 
policymaker sitting in a high level room uh, developing strategy around uh, you know different war game scenarios and where I think I'm not going to get it totally right, but you know they're they're doing a, an analysis and somebody says under under this you know under un, under this pathway or this strategy only three million people die and the guy just goes you know says only three million <laughs> you know as if to say that's that's that we should all be cognizant in this room of of that that's that's uh, something we should all recognize that, that that's 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 not a that's not a good alternative and and the fact that he felt and his when he tells the story that to Carol Cohn that that he he says that he feels ashamed and he's made to feel ostracized and he's basically disinvited from participating because you know th that his reaction to everyone else said that he was weak and feminine and so that's the construct that we're starting with and that's what we're working through um, and that's very much what I think the movement for humanitarian disarmament and this what they call the humanitarian shift as I said has has sought to turn on its head and and introduce those voices uh, into into the discussion um, and, and and to be clear of course that that because I've had to think this through for myself having joined this community and and tried to think you know well first of all I'm a white cis male so what is my role here and how 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 should I um, uh, what should I do about 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 this and 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 to just to emphasize for I mean probably everyone in this room is more sensitive to this than I am but uh, just the notion that we're not talking of course about always about men and women in this context we're talking about masculine masculinity and feminism and those are you know those of course are, are different um, and and to that point even I mean while while representation of women in in, in state delegations is, is certainly something that's part of this. It's definitely not all of it. I mean, we've had, uh, you know, there's organizations like Article 36 in our community that has studied what's the, what's the representation of women on, on state delegations, for instance, and, you know, to, to, to demonstrate how, uh, how badly, in most cases, women are represented on, in, in disarmament delegations. Um, but with the uh, with the realization that that's not the end of the issue, of course. I mean, we we're not looking to um, we're not looking to uh, if 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 the only thing we changed was uh, you know the 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 way that uh, the putting more women in a delegation. If those women rose to power in a structure that was masculine, then we're not we're not through the woods in this with this problem in any way. So it's it's really about the perspectives and. And that's an opportunity for, for people of all genders, of course, to, to work with. Um. So in a moment, we're going to open up to the, to the audience, um, to the students for questions. Um, but before that, mm -hmm. I always end my conversations with my guests uh, with the engendered questionnaire, mm -hmm. which I ask all of my guests. I've adapted it from the inside the Actors Studio questionnaire, which you probably are familiar with as an actor, <laughs> oh, you're probably a fan of yeah, James uh, Lipton. <laughs> I, don't have a, I don't have a favorite word. So, uh, first question, what, what is at stake in the struggle to end gender-based violence and oppression? Well, I guess um, I could say that there's a range of, of, of things at stake here. I mean, at the very least, at stake is uh, the life and safety of those who are oppressed by the uh, by by the structure in place, um, and together with the the opportunity for a more rich and full existence by those who are not oppressed. But if that's not enough for you, at the other end of the spectrum, at the maximum, and I mean sincerely that I think that what's at stake is life itself, civilization, because as I was just saying, I think that having a non-patriarchal approach to security, in my opinion, is the key to a, changing the, the environment to make it, to make a more cooperative environment in terms, in, in world security in a way that is necessary to achieve change and, um, and a lasting peace. What gives you hope? What gives me hope is so many things. Uh, my nephew, the Parkland students, 
to you know to 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 as you said today is the one year anniversary of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas massacre and their work has been really inspiring um, so many women taking to Congress in 2018 and our treaty you know I could say to that question so on July 7th 2017 the day that the treaty was uh, adopted all the states got to go around and make statements about why they voted how they voted and the Irish the Irish foreign minister this really stuck with me that the Irish foreign minister um, he quoted an Irish poet Seamus Haney in his remarks and made this distinction that's really stuck with me and I'm not gonna get it word for word but it's something like he's distinguishing hope from optimism so you've asked about hope and he says and this is this important semantic difference for me now is he says uh, hope is not optimism which expects things to turn out well that's what optimism is but hope is rather something that's more rooted in the conviction that there's a good that's worth fighting for and I thought that was quite profound I'm optimistic that this treaty will enter into force that's what I'm working on um, and I'm hopeful that humanity will will see a way to through through its two great existential threats that we're dealing with right now climate change and nuclear weapons both of our own making you know and and uh, and these are the only two right now. I mean, these are the two that we should all be focused on, I believe. And I believe, too, that we can solve them. Uh, and so I hope that we, that we use our great ingenuity. We created these problems, and we can end them. Um, I believe in the power of humanity to save us from the power of humanity. Final question. What can we do more of, less of, start or stop? as individuals or as a society to end gender-based violence? Well, I feel like that's an opportunity for me to tell everyone what they can do to, to support our agenda. Um, you know, because I do think that, I do think, again, not being an authority on, in any way on, on gender-related issues, but I do think that these things go hand in hand. Um, I do think, again, that you know, South Africa in their statement on that July 7th, by the way, they, they, uh, this isn't the first time they said this, but they, they coined the term nuclear apartheid, uh, you know, talking about the great power that the nuclear possessor states have and, 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 and utilize over those states that, that don't. Um, and so if you see that nexus, if you see the intersectionality there, then and these, and I mean, I didn't even speak specifically to you, but you're public health students, if you are, I think you are. Um, you know, we have many arguments to make about the impact of uh, not just the use of a nuclear weapon in warfare, but even the development uh, of nuclear weapons, the maintenance of these arsenals, the testing, of course, of nuclear weapons and its great impact on public health. Um, uh, I hope that I can help people find, and I haven't spoken that much about it here, but the the way that their cause intersects with our cause. So if you are believe, if you believe that, then to your question, what can you do? You can join us. I mean, I'm a member, a campaigner for ICANN, but I told you how, how I got to it, and anyone can, in theory. Um, you need to go to our nuclearband.org, and uh, you can sign up and join for act updates on actions globally and locally. Um, that's our international organization. We have many well, I can as a I didn't really set this up, but as a is a is a giant campaign uh, comprised of, I think it's now 532 partner organizations in 100 and I think 103 countries at the moment. So you know in the U.S. we have many partners. You can look at nuclearban.us for U.S. related actions. Um, you can ask your Congress people to sign our parliamentary pledge, which is a you know, a, a commitment by legislators to work for their government to join the treaty. That's on the ICANN website. You can ask your mayors to and your city council members to join the ICANN city appeal to say that your city uh, aligns with the treaty. You can work to divest your own money, but also your city's money and your financial institutions and your school's money here, you know, from, from the uh, companies that finance nuclear weapons. We have a project and I'm working on one specifically in New York, but uh, overall, the, the, the Don't Bank on the Bomb project and report addresses um, this. You can read a treaty, <laughs> you know, um, you can talk about the treaty, uh, you can change the way we talk about nuclear weapons. Um, 
you know, we may not today be able to knock on the White House door and stop the way that Trump and Kim Jong-un engage each other about, uh, you know, threaten each other with nuclear annihilation. But by bringing about a change in the way we talk about this issue individually, um, especially as Americans, to the extent we're Americans here, um, we can change the way we engage uh, on a broader scale uh, and stop future leaders from behaving this way. Um, so those are some That's of the a lot. things we so can do. That's a lot. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Seth. Yeah, thank you.